Will the congregation ask the question? They will, probably. You can hang meat in here. What now? I said you can hang meat in here. Feels great. Yeah. You know, it's it's always good to have a fat person in charge of the thermostat if you're going to be on the platform. I'd rather be cold than hot. Yeah, I had to. Yep. Hey. Good to see you. I don't believe I know you. <laughs> you used to have a fellow who looked a lot like you, but he was a great deal bigger than you are. <laughs> well, Will was um, pretty generous when he mentioned me last week. I haven't quite lost 50. I've lost 45, but I haven't lost 50 yet. <laughs> so, I've lost. And I got 15 more to go. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I did that seven years ago. I got down to this. I don't know what I got down to. Yeah. And I'm going to have to get, I haven't got back up to where I lost. Well, about seven years ago, I weighed 360 pounds. And um, um, I bought me a recumbent bicycle. And I rode that thing up a mile and a half. But that was me. And, 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 Thank you for choosing to worship today. Uh, just by way of announcements, uh, I want to say thank you, church, for what you gave uh, for the Ernie Easterling uh, special offering that we had. Uh, we sent $8,000 to Ernie and Wendy. Uh, preliminary counts from last night, from July till last night, Smith County has raised $115,000 for Ernie and Wendy. Um, there's an old-fashioned Hebrew word for that. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you for giving, and I thank, thank you for giving of your heart. I appreciate it. I know they do. Be in prayer for Ernie and Wendy. Um, the physical therapist that was coming to stay with them got turned around uh, in Texas and was sent back to Costa Rica. So uh, be in prayer that God works that situation out. Um, 
after today, we will not have Sunday school uh, for the foreseeable future. The way that uh, COVID cases are rising in our area and the, the inability to socially distance in Sunday school, uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to pause Sunday school. We will still have a morning service. We will still have a Wednesday night service. Uh, but right now, we are just uh, pressing the pause button on Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school materials will be available. Uh, I think we've got one more Sunday left in the quarter. Uh, they'll be ready in the uh, foyer next week. So you stop by and pick up those. You can still do it at home. It's just we won't be gathering uh, together here. Uh, deacons, don't forget we need to talk for just a few minutes after church. Next Sunday we'll have a business meeting. Um, seems like there's something else I'm supposed to announce. Anybody else have any other announcements? If not, Brother John, come please. Well, it, it's Sunday morning again. It's good to be here on Sunday morning with you. Uh, we're going to sing an old chorus and a new chorus this morning. The King is coming, as some of Bill Gates' best. And then uh, I stand in awe. So uh, let's stand together while we sing. Oh, the King is coming. decisions to make, uh, be in prayer for Ricky and Patricia and the rest of the family as they look after her, uh, be in prayer for uh, Raleigh Junior High 
and the, the student and the family that was lost. So be in prayer for them. Uh, Michaela Robinson. Robinson. Be in prayer for the Robinsons. Be in prayer for the students, the faculty. Uh, sometimes we don't have all the answers, but I know a man who does. Yeah. Any other requests this morning before we go to the Lord and Lord prayer? Kobe and Aisha and Sanders. Yeah. Kobe and Ethan have uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, <coughs> Jimmy Dale and uh, Mr. Billy Joe have uh, the baby, baby. Uh, so be in prayer for them as they look after the baby. Just be in prayer for uh, Kobe and his mother <coughs> as they recover. Brother Ed and Miss Pam Meadows are both at home. Uh, so be in pr continue to pray for them. Um, Ed is having some GI issues uh, from COVID. Uh, so, uh, so pray for he and Pam. Any others? Miss Dorita Riles uh, got a good report this morning. Her, her blood gases are looking a little better. They reduced the ventilator setting some, so uh, we praise God for that. Any others? Yeah, the Reed family. It was a friend of Blake's that um, when he was at Wharton, he had gone home with him a couple of times. Um, but the little two year old, 20 month old, um, the dad back day for him went over it. And the five year old brother saw David. Pray for the five-year-old. Pray for that daddy. Mm -hmm. Mercy. Well, the dementia is on me right now, but uh, the people that live in the Bradshaw house yonder that came to church here for a while. Um, the Vest. Vest. Dale and Linda Vest are moving uh, to Nashville. Uh, Mr. Dale, his health is continuing to fail him. Um, and it's gotten to the point that Miss. Miss Linda can't take care of him by herself. Um, they are looking to rehome an Australian Shepherd and something else dog if anybody wants to bless their hearts and take home a puppy. Um, I know we have a lot of animal lovers in the house, but be in prayer for the best as, as they get ready to, uh, to move. <clears throat> Mr. Dale has been a tremendous asset to our fire department and he will be greatly missed. Any others? Jeff and Lori Urban, you've seen them. They've come uh, a few times with, with Katie and I. Uh, they both tested positive uh, for COVID yesterday on their 29th anniversary. Uh, we told Lori if she could put up with him for 29 years, two weeks wouldn't be a problem. So. <laughs> but be in prayer for them. Any others? If not, would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Father, Lord, we complain, we grumble. God, we get our feelings hurt, we get mad, we get aggravated. But Father, after hearing those requests, God, none of that matters. Lord, for these families, Lord, that are losing children, God, I pray that you would just touch their hearts, Lord, that the, the gap, Lord, the, the, the hole that's left, Father, I pray that you would fill it, Lord, as nobody else can. Lord, for the people who are fighting this, this coronavirus, God, for the people who've lost loved ones from it, God, the, the people who are working day in and day out in hospitals, funeral homes, Father, I pray that you would touch them. God, I pray that you would renew their strength. Father, our days here look dark and dreary, but God, there's a day coming that will outshine them all. Father, we pray for that day. Lord, we long for that day. But in, in the meantime, Father, will we get serious about leading the people to you? Father, for our troops this morning that are deploying all across this land, Father, I pray for their safety. God, I pray for their, their mental health. Father, I pray for their strength, their stability. God, I pray for a mission accomplished. Father, I pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people this morning. Father, would you sit down in this place? Would you tune our hearts to you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. His eye is on the sparrow. It'll be interesting to see how we all come together singing this because everybody's got a different idea of how it's supposed to go. Um, so... Uh, let's see if we can all stay together on it. 
All three stanzas, his eyes on the sparrow. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my
lunchbox and your folder. So is your backpack real heavy? <clears throat> no? no? No. I was also to show what I got in my backpack today. Y'all want to see what I got in mine? It's been a long week. Um, Y'all ever get worried about stuff? Uh, you worried if I have candy or not? <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I don't know. I don't know. I've got candy in my backpack. Okay, okay.
Yeah. Um, do y'all have any worry of but don't worry in my little front zipper? I have my candy stash. <laughs> Behind my front zipper is my candy stash. We're gonna cover it back up. And and so anyway, I, I just wanna know, is there some stuff that y'all worry about? Like do you worry about if you're gonna fail a test, or do you worry about if you're gonna be late for school? Or do you worry about if you're gonna get in trouble because you like to talk too much? Do y'all worry about anything like that? Now that you've been going back to school? No. What do you have anything you worry about? Are you scared of anything? Monsters or no? What y'all ain't scared of nothing? <laughs> and you ain't worried about nothing? <laughs> Woo! Are you Susan? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I worry about stuff, and and, and sometimes I find out it's just we're not real necessary. And so I was doing my little study. I ain't gonna make me I was studying my children's sermon, and and I didn't really. It what I wasn't really feeling it. So I went on to Plan B because I got some I got some disturbing news yesterday, and 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 I couldn't get the news off my mind, and, and I just kept I just like I I, I had to go to Jesus because I was I was I was on the struggle bus, and, and I was just having a hard time. I was having a hard time with it all, and so um, while, while I was doing it, I, I just changed my children's sermon because I found out when when I go and study my children's sermon, I understand what's going on a little better. It puts it down where I can understand it, and, and it helps me. So I wanted to share my children's sermon with y'all this morning. Now I'm gonna put this all back in because it says in the Bible, Jesus said to worry. He said that worrying is useless. It means I ain't supposed to be worrying. Now, if we're going to have a volunteer this morning, then y'all see what I got in my backpack, right? So I'm going to have a volunteer, but in Matthew it says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. It's about like the birds. They don't worry about what they're going to eat because God takes care of them. He says, do not worry. That's what Jesus says in the Bible. And since we're supposed to be able to depend on Jesus, but if we are, if, if, if I have been carrying my weak load of worries and burdens with me all week, y'all, I'm not. I've been dragging that thing around all week. And it, 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 everything's so hot, it just keeps adding and adding. So I want to know who is going to be my volunteer to stand up while I do the children's sermon and, and wear my backpack. Woo! <laughs> Come here. Well, now, just give me a plate. Can you help put it on his back? Please help put it on his back. He's going to stand up with, and he's going to hold my backpack because he wants to run fast. I know he wants to try to fit me that way down. But now if it starts to hurt, you want to take it off with that plate. Okay. Okay. Can you stand there? Don't, don't move. That's how much your backpack weighs. Well, then you just ought to put it on every day and start running. And then take it off, and then you're going to be really fast. You, I just get some maturity training for you. But wait, don't, don't move too much. Okay, just stand. You just stand right there, and then we're going to see if you can just stand and not get into that heavy weight, okay? Okay, breathe, breathe through it. So it says, I can trust God with my worries. Who can we trust? Who can we trust? Say God, Susie, because they're not talking to me. You're going to talk to them. It says, so humble yourselves. God, yes, thank you, Lily. It says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. Give all of your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. <laughs> now, when we worry, we are being prideful. We're saying, I can do this, God. I can do this. I don't need to give you my worries because I'm strong enough to do it myself. Well, that's just letting Satan win. Because why do I want to carry around that weight day in and day out? Why? Do I want to carry that around when God said he will carry it for me? Now, he makes that look easy. I promise y'all it ain't that easy. <laughs> so we are to give our cares. To, I told you stand here and be still. It's going to tell you so you're having to just be, be still. Right, right there, right there. Are, do you listen well in school? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So worry and fear, it, 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 will, it will take over our lives if we let it. And we have to stop. And we have to turn around. Come in. Turn around. Turn around. All right. Come in closer. All right. Now take your arms out. 
Oh, how does it feel now that that has been removed from your back? The same. It does not feel the same. I can tell you it don't because I just traveled a little ways with it and that thing was pretty heavy. It'll wear you down if you did it for days and days. Okay, you can, you can sit down there with me. Now, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, I've got something I want you to say. I want all of you to say it. Never worry. Say it. Never worry. Pray always. Pray always. Give thanks. Thanks. That's what it, that's what Paul explains. Our part in all of this. I'm getting all my stuff out. Now I'm going, I'm going to leave my Bible in here, okay? Because I'm going to take Jesus with me everywhere I go. I'm going to carry it around that. I'm going to take Jesus with me everywhere I go. And now, I'm going to take my backpack, and I'm going to put it on my back. And now, I can walk around, and I can have my shoulders up, and I can have my head up, and I don't feel like I'm about to fall over, because I just gave all of my burdens, and all of my worries, and all of my cares. I'm down here at this altar, and I just laid it all to Jesus. And he took it for me, huh? After church, you can carry it around the way. Okay. It says, come to me, all of you who are weak, weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is there to carry our burdens for us. He is so much stronger. He's so much powerful. He's so much wiser. He is so much more than we can ever imagine. And he is going to help us run our race. He's going to lighten our load so that I can run really fast. I can let zoom zoom. You can zoom zoom? Yes, but God's going to help us zoom zoom even more. So anyway, I want you to never worry, pray always, and give thanks. And I've got a little bitty backpack. I guess I brought one down here, Sabina. I've got some little bitty backpacks. And you're going to put this in your little bitty backpack that says, never worry, pray always, and give thanks. And so when you're at school and you might get a little worried, you can pull out your little piece of paper and it tells you what to do. Because Paul told us this is how we are supposed to do. Never worry, pray always, and give thanks. So y'all come see me out here at church and we'll work on getting you a backpack that you can carry. Okay? Will y'all pray with me this morning? Dear Lord, thank you for letting us come here to your house Lord, and worship you. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for taking the weights out of our backpack, Lord. Thank you for carrying our worries. Thank you for guarding our hearts and our minds, Lord, and for giving us peace. And, Lord, we might not ever understand, but we know who does. Lord, we might not feel like we have the strength, but we know that you do. Let us turn to you, Lord, in these times of trouble. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's pay Let's pay Come see me church. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by a heavy stone, Messiah still.
chicken houses that an inspector will go to tomorrow to decide if he gets to keep them open or not. Had a church member from the church I pastored in the Delta text me and say, Brother Will, my nephew is deploying in the morning. He's a Marine, and although they can't tell us where he's going, we have a good idea. Sometimes it's necessary to preach on the destruction of Nineveh and the joy that it caused Judah, but today ain't one of those days. In 1940, the British formed their parachute regiment. They were known for their courage, their fortitude, the ability to fight even when hungry, exhausted, and hopelessly outnumbered. But they adopted a motto in Latin, you drink a paritus. It means ready for anything. Ready for anything. You know, you've got to be ready for anything. Your life could change with a phone call. If you're a pastor, your life just about changes with a phone call, your day changes with a phone call, or when somebody drops by, or any number of things, but you know it's true for all of us. You open an envelope, you get a phone call, you get an email, your boss walks into your office and wants to speak to you. Life can change. And you have to be ready for that change. Now, I for one, hate change. I don't like it. Once something starts working, I like to stay that way. I like to keep it that way. But there are times that are necessary for us to change. And when you live a life that is ready for anything, you adapt and overcome with the changes that life brings. You know, there's a lot. You, you heard our prayer request this morning, and there are many more. But suffering... Hardship, pain, depression, defeat. You know, it's been around since the early ages. Stay in Philippians. Just trust your pastor for a moment. In the book of Job, we find a story that the, the text appears late, but the story appears early. That means the language that Job is written with you would situate Job where it is, but the actual story of Job, as told in the ancient Near Eastern context, you would actually situate right after 
the fall in the Garden of Eden before the flood. But you picture it. Job, in Job chapter 1, has just lost basically everything. But put yourselves in the picture or in the shoes of Mrs. Job. Mrs. Job has just lost her security. Her husband has had his character attacked. They lost property, children. Her husband's health has now been attacked. Exasperated, she cries out, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. <clears throat> Mighty bold words. <clears throat> In other words, you're still worshiping God. When she found Job, this is Job chapter 2 and verse 9, by the way. When she found Job, he was sitting in a pile of ashes and he was scraping his skin with a shattered clay pot. It's, it's in the book. It says he was scraping his skin with potsherd. And when she looked at him, she said, Why are you doing this? She cries out, Just curse God and die. There is a purpose in your pain. We'll get to the message in a minute, and it'll be quick. There's a purpose in your pain. How can you enlist suffering and make it your servant? Well, like Job, receive it as a gift from God. Job, in chapter 1 and verse 21, he looked at his wife and he said, Should we not take the good along with the bad? Should we not take God's blessings along with these rainy days? Receive it as a gift from God because when you emerge on the other side, you've got a testimony that is powerful. But rely on God's grace because with suffering comes His grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. But reflect on the glory of it. That's where we're going to focus at today. The Apostle Paul is a great example of glorifying the Lord in suffering. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and you'll find out just exactly what Paul was going through. Paul and Apollos, the Bible plainly says they're hungry, they're homeless, they don't have much clothes, the world is falling in on them, and Paul said, but I want y'all to imitate me. Now, that doesn't mean go around hungry, homeless, and barely clothed. No, what it meant was when you find yourself and the cards are stacked against you, Sing, oh praise the name of the Lord our God. Paul's pain became a platform and he declared the glory of God to the nations and to generations through this platform. If you're here and you're suffering today, take a minute and remind yourself of this truth. Whatever I am going through, Jesus has already experienced and he'll bring me through it. When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, he is sitting in a Roman prison with no legitimate charge against him. But with no hope in sight of regaining his freedom, all of us, we would have completely understood if he had used his letter to complain about his circumstances, to grumble, to moan for sympathy, to say that these people are aggravating because they've imprisoned him so that he cannot preach the gospel but instead, Paul chose to be a victor rather than a victim by showing and demonstrating a capacity and a strength to live in the circumstances that he had been dealt, that he found himself facing, to say, my life is a life that is ready for anything. Look with me in Philippians chapter 4. Let's begin reading in verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. 
I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul writes and says, I have learned this. That is repeated. It's through the repeated life experiences that Paul has that he comes to this peaceful, contented conclusion. His life had reached the place where he could say, no matter why, no matter where, no matter what, I have been given from God what it takes to get me through. Paul had learned to be content. How many of you are content? How many of you are content? Are you happy with the way things are right now? When you want something, are you content to keep what you have or will you keep going until you get what you want? Paul said, I am content being hungry, being homeless, not having clothes on my back, not having the things which I left for this. But rather Paul says, I'm content. He was content with his provision. Look in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Paul is telling the Philippian church, you just sent me a love offering and it couldn't have come at a better time. I appreciate it. It's not because you didn't care, but it's because you didn't have the opportunity to send it. Uh, maybe COVID was going around and they couldn't get out, but just making sure y'all were with me. Smile. It's Sunday and he's still on the throne. Paul arrived at this contentment and he told the Philippian church, thank you for your generosity. It's not that you didn't care, but that you liked the opportunity. But as, as Paul is getting there, we see there is a contentedness in his heart. Paul repeated this contentedness. In 2 Corinthians 8 9, the Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. You may not have a nickel to your name today, but if you are a child of God, you are rich beyond any dollar amount or measure. Paul could accept whatever came in his life because he was content with what he had. He learned that it's not about what he had or what he didn't have, but it's about the provision that God had put into his life. God was taking care of him. We sang a song just a few minutes ago. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he watches me. Paul is saying that he was ready to live a life prepared for anything because he was content with the provision that he had. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul told Timothy, Godliness with contentment is great gain. <coughs> you know, there's a, a cute little saying that's been going around for the ages. Well, I've never seen a trailer hitch or a U-Haul attached to the back of a hearse. <coughs> no, we got smarter. Now we put drawers in the lids of those caskets that only the funeral director has a key to, and he can unlock it. And they call them memory safes. You know, you can put pictures and letters. And, or in the case of, here's the sales pitch to it. One lady decided that her husband, or her husband wanted to be buried with all the money that he had. So her husband <coughs> said, I want to be buried with all the money I got. She wrote him a check and put it in the memory safe. That's the sales pitch for that casket. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that you will carry nothing out. Amen. We teach our children the Lord's Prayer, but we adults, we need to be reminded of it. 
and give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's worries are there and they are plenty. But Jesus said sufficient are the worries for today. I was worried about all kind of stuff. You know, my, my last, my, hopefully my last semester of seminary starts tomorrow. I've got in big letters on my calendar, I will graduate at some point in the next two years. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I was worried about all kinds of stuff. But a message that says a parent lost her child. To hear about a daddy. Back and over his child. Yeah. I got problems. <laughs> Paul was looking at it and Paul said, I've learned to be content. Because God provided everything that I need. Yeah. Discontentment is a plague of the soul. And it will take away your joy. It will take away your peace. You see no matter how much you have. If you're not content with what you've got. You are the poorest person in the world. The question is. What is contentment? Contentment is not getting what you want. But wanting what you already have. <coughs> Because you see, God supplies what you don't have. Look in verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I need a new truck. Is that what God provides? I need a new tractor. Is that what God provides? I need a new, no, no, no. What did Jesus provide for you? Salvation, full and free. It's not a, it, it's not a supply of a, a animate or an inanimate object. It's a supply of a spiritual object. We fear because we think, our, we think our needs aren't going to be met. We think that the things that we think are meeting our needs are going to be taken away from us. But God supplied what Paul didn't have, and it was not something that was material. There are fears running all around us. People are afraid about their job. People are afraid about retirement. People are afraid about their children that are going to fight a battle that they didn't ask for. People are worried about kids going back to school. People are worried about what color carpet we may put in the church. That's not here. We worry about things that absolutely don't matter. <clears throat> How many of you are carrying around a 15 pound weight and three books in your backpack that are totally unnecessary? <laughs> Those things that are heavy to you, let them go. I say, preacher, that's not biblical. Paul said, I placed all my burdens on him. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches. $115,000 in Smith County, one of the least populated, poorest counties in all of the state of Mississippi, according to his riches. You cannot outgive God, people. You can't out-trust him. You can't out-give him. You're not God. Never have been, never will be. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Jesus. By Jesus. The gift that Jesus is giving you is more than you need. You ought to be content with it. David expressed that truth in Psalm 23. All of us can say it. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my guide. The Lord is my farmer. The Lord owns me. I will not want. It doesn't mean we'll all live in a mansion. 
with overflowing cupboards and drive luxury cars. But it does mean that he'll continue to provide. <coughs> it means that he'll sustain what you already have. Verse 18 says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received a from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. God sustains what you've already got. If you are a child of God, what resides in your heart is enough to get you through today and all of your tomorrows. And Paul would put it this way, I am persuaded that the things that I have committed to him, he will deliver upon against that day that he comes back. You know, we sing about it. I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able. But we don't trust him when it comes down to it. We, we want to do things our way. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He'll never suffer the righteous to be moved. God will sustain what you've already got. He'll satisfy what you can't have. When Katie and I bought my truck, we were living in Batesville, and I was dealing with Gray Daniels. Did you know that if you cross into North Mississippi, that's north of Canton. If you get into North Mississippi, y'all will catch that later. <laughs> trucks across the border are $10,000 higher. So I called Gray Daniels Chevrolet. I told them what I wanted. The lady said, yes, sir, we got one on the lot. I said, we're on our way. We drove up. I told her I wanted a 2018 Chevrolet Colorado with a five-cylinder diesel in it. I wanted it black with black leather seats, a lot of chrome, spraying bed liner toolbox. I mean, I had it pegged out exactly what I wanted. She said, yes, sir, we can order that for you. She came back and she said, that'd be $72,000. I said, what? She said, yes, sir, $72,000. I looked at her and said, what about that little brown truck sitting right there? <laughs> you know why I wanted one like that? Because I saw one and I coveted it. I had to have it. Jacob's daddy is one of my very best friends. There's a saying in the Ware household, just one more piece of equipment. <laughs> Two chicken houses full of tractors and implements, but just one more piece of equipment. I got a picture last year of a hay wrapper that said, just one more piece of equipment. But Paul said, he'll sustain what you've already got. And if you're coveting something, his grace is more sufficient to, to say, you don't need that, but rather this is what you need. I got to move for time's sake. He was content with his provision. He was, he was content with what he had. But don't miss this, church. Paul was courageous with his problems. Do you have problems? Verse 12 says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. The word abased is describing a river running low. The word abound is describing a river overflowing. Scraping the bottom of the barrel, if you will, versus having it flowing over. My great-grandmother had a flower bin. It, it was really and truly a 25-gallon silver pail bucket that would close that back in the day when you could buy Martha White flour in the sack, you know, they had the little wash rags sewed to them. You could go and buy them and you'd put it in there and Granny had that, that, that flour bin and she had a Jacob Bromwell sifter. I thought Katie needed one of those things. You know, Jacob Bromwell's still in business, but that sifter that my Granny might have paid $5 for back in the day will now cost you over 100 
periodically Granny would get down to the bottom of the barrel and she'd have to hit the bottom of it. That flower had gotten caked up down there. But we knew that when Granny got ready to make biscuits again, all she'd do is she'd reach over there and she'd pull that string on that flour sack and she'd pour that new stuff in there. We were content when the flour bin was almost empty because we knew and we rested in the fact Granny is going to fill it and when she fills it, there's more biscuits on the way. That's what Paul said. Our problem is there are too many of us that have forgot what it's like to be hungry, that have forgot what it's like to be thirsty. We have gotten so comfortable living such a lavish lifestyle that our problems are not problems anymore. A mama went to bed last night, and it's going to be some time before she sees a baby girl again. A daddy had to put a truck in park and get out and find the unthinkable. Paul said, I've learned what it's like to live in a dry creek. And I know what it's like to live in a creek that's overflowing. He was courageous with his problems. We can be courageous with our problems because of the gracious things of life. I got to see my daughter's face. Thursday. She has her mama's nose. And bless her heart, y'all will have to pray for her because she ain't got no hair. <laughs> I wonder where she got that from. Thank God, in the middle of your problems, thank God for the kiss of a baby. Thank God for the love of a mother. Thank God for friendship. Thank God for health, for happiness. Thank God for the church. Amen. Paul said, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned to be full and I've learned to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul appreciated the gracious things of life. Paul appreciated the graphic things of life. Paul would even go so far as in Romans to say where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Paul was courageous about his problems. Paul didn't have a problem telling you about his problems. But because of my last point, I promise we're out of here. He was courageous about his problems because he was confident with his position. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Athletes have adopted that to say, I can win this ball game, I can win this race, I can throw this shot put, I can do this, I can do that. that. That is not at all what this verse is referring to. Paul was very aware of the difficulties and trials of his life, but more often than not, you don't find Paul reflecting on the problems of his life, but you find him reflecting on the blessings of of his life because he had assumed a position as with Christ as his Lord that made him available to understand I don't have to do this. I don't have to focus on the bad because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He was a very, very aware of who he was in Christ. His strength came through Christ. So what he did was to take the worst of the worst of his life and put it up against the backdrop of all eternity and he confidently said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You may be fighting hell by the acre in your life. <coughs> Or you may be so well off that you don't remember what it's like to struggle with anything. When you're confident with your position in Christ, material things, things of this world, things of anything else don't matter. Paul got to that point because he had a sure foundation. Because he had a steadfast fellowship. 
and because he had a secure future. The writer of Hebrews said, This we have as an anchor for the soul, both steadfast and sure, a hope that is not perishable. How do you deal with the things of life? You live a life that is ready for anything. How do you live a life that is ready for anything? It's only through the blood of the Lamb. It's only through the assurance that Jesus gives. There's a hymn that I'm going to close with. It says, Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it, then, where'er you go. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. Oh, the favor of the Father in this name we may enjoy. At the name of Jesus, bowing, falling, prostrate at his feet, claim his victory or evil, and the enemy defeat. Precious name, oh, how sweet, the hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. How do you live a life that's ready for anything? By taking the name of Jesus. Let's all pray. Father, as we stand and Lord, as we pray, God, I pray that you would do what only you can. Lord, we're tired. We're weary. Father, we're aggravated with the things of the world, but Father, we long for the day that we don't have to do this anymore. Father, we long for the day that we'll sing around the throne eternal. Lord, that we'll worship you. But Lord, until then, God, I pray that you would move in hearts. God, I pray that people would come to know you. Father, I pray that above all, Lord, we'd recognize our position in you. Forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Evidently, I was praying hard. <laughs> this morning, Landry and Misty and Chase and Matt come wishing to unite with this body of believers here at First Baptist Church, Polkville. So church, if you will love them, lead them, and loose them to serve Jesus in these last days, would you signal by saying, it's about time. <laughs> I like standing next to Landry. I don't look so small. <laughs> We're excited about what God's doing here and what God's going to do through this precious family. Would you pray with us? Mark, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? <coughs>